This episode of The Climate Show is brought to you by Celsius.co.nz Hottopic.co.nz Skepticalscience.com Scoop.co.nz And KiwiFM And joining us now here on The Climate Show, David Suzuki, world-renowned environmentalist, scientist, broadcaster, an absolute master at being able to communicate scientific issues uh, to the public all around the world. And he's here to promote his um, a brand new film, Force of Nature. Hello to you, David. Hello. Hi, David. Welcome back to New Zealand. You've been here twice in the last year, I think. Don't say that too loudly, please. I uh, <laughs> never intended that, and I know there's a heavy carbon footprint from flying all the way here. Yes, well, yeah, I was I was thinking that that probably um, is it. Do you offset your um your travel? Well, I've been anyway? offsetting my uh, carbon emissions now for over five years, and huh. actually four years ago in Australia, I fell in love with Australia when I first mis- visited in 1988, and I was going back every year, at least once a year. Four years ago, I said, look, I'm never coming back. Uh, My carbon footprint's too high. Right. Then suddenly I end up coming back twice in less than six months. It's pretty pretty embarrassing. Well, there you go. Now, um, just uh, on that tip of of, um, talking to audiences about science, I mean, you've had many, many decades of experience of this. and 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 there's, and also um, trying to communicate ideas of environmentalism and looking after everyone around you. Do you despair because things don't seem to be getting any better? Well, it's uh, very surprising. I did my first television series in 1962. This is the year Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. Yeah. And at that time, I was appalled at the level of scientific illiteracy among the general public in Canada that was reflected in the absolute scientific ignorance in the people that we elected to office. So I chose to go into the media in order to provide information, to make science accessible, because I felt that science and what it was learning was too important to just leave to corporations and and politicians to deal with. We have in the last 20 years been going backwards. And what has been shocking to me is the incredible power of the corporate agenda Mm. that is corporations you know we saw we saw it with the tobacco industry we saw we see it with the pharmaceutical industry and now with the fossil fuel industry they are so wealthy and will pour tens and tens of millions of dollars into campaigns to create confusion on the part of the public i never thought for a, a minute that corporations would embark on programs that I, quite frankly, I think are evil. Yeah. When you look at what Monsanto is now doing with, with GM, pressing it into the developing world and, uh, and around the world, when you look at the tobacco industry that knew for decades that the science was in about the harmful effects of smoking and yet the denial that went on, when you look at the record of the fossil fuel industry that is known since the 1990s that the science is in on climate change mm. and yet has deliberately spent millions of dollars saying this is junk science, setting up blog sites, supporting a handful of skeptics. If this isn't crime or criminal, I don't know what is. Mm. I keep calling it an intergenerational crime. In the name of profit, these corporations, and that's the only reason these corporations exist, is to make money. In the name of maximizing profit, they are essentially foisting on future generations a problem that is getting worse and worse. Mm. This is criminal. David, how do we go about instilling some sense of um, responsibility, corporate responsibility? I mean, there's much talk in business circles, sustainable business, triple bottom line accounting and so on. But how on earth do we get around this issue that um, big, big companies, the mega corporations are willing to sell our future? for a few billionaires profit well we have to get we have to break that connection between government and the corporations right now corporate funding of of political campaigns is the primary source of money and you know it's the classic thing whoever pays a piper calls the tunes and we've got to break that 
that connection. We get the environment, we get new environment ministers at the federal level all the time. Who are the first people the new environment minister calls? It's not environmentalists who should be their constituency, it's the corporations. Corporations are right in there with the new ministers of the environment. That's got to be broken. How do you do that? We live in a democracy. In a democracy, people have to vote. Not just vote, we have to get out there and be a part of the whole political process. If politicians, as we have had in Canada for five years now, we've had a prime minister who has absolutely ignored climate change. He doesn't believe it. He hasn't done anything about implementing any reductions uh, in, uh, through government legislation or taxation. He gets away with it because we in the public have allowed him to get away with it. He can't, we had a, a prime, our prime minister was opposed by, uh, the, in the last election by the leader of the major opposition party basing his whole campaign, the opposition member, on a climate, on a, a carbon tax was a very, very bold uh, proposal. Our Prime Minister's response to what economists agree is the most effective tool we have to change behavior, a carbon tax, putting a price on carbon, our Prime Minister's response to it was, that's crazy. And that's all he ever said about this powerful tool. And the media allowed the Prime Minister to get away with this. Mm. Well, the only reason the media allowed that is because the public didn't give a, a damn about it, or at least uh, they see taxation as, oh, a horrible thing. We've got to start getting much more engaged if we care about the future. And right now, we don't have a democracy because we're not getting up there and registering our concerns. And so isn't one of the problems here the, the election cycle? Well, in uh, I, I, what's your cycle here federally? It's three, three years. Yeah, well, I mean, it always amazes me in, in uh, Australia where every time I go back, you know, there's a whole new gang coming in. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the shortness is, is really a, a, a big problem. But, you know, we've, we've got a five-year cycle, but uh, we've got, had now um, a minority government for five years. Mm. And we've had three elections during that time. Each time the public has returned uh, a minority government. Because the opposition is so weak, we've had this mi minority government led by the conservatives that um, has basically been concerned from one election to the next with what? Mm. How the hell do we get a majority? Mm. That's all anybody has thought about. Well, guess what? We're fiddling away while the future, our emissions are climbing like that. We're not doing anything to bring that to a halt and reverse it. Our children's future is being compromised by the the limitation of our of our mm. our uh, electoral time. But whether it's three or five years, the problem is that young people, children, don't vote. Future generations don't even exist. Yeah. So why should any politician, you know, in Canada, what we've got to do is start spending tens of billions of dollars now to go to a carbon-free future. We've got to do it, and we've got to do it within a decade. But what politician is going to say, you elect me, and I'm going to start spending $20 billion a year to get onto a different energy future, mm -hmm. when our country depends on fossil fuels? We're a petrol country. There is no way any politician, even if they knew how serious it was, would ever get up there and run on that agenda. They'd be booted out of... They would never get elected. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem that the political... The political time frame is simply too short to actually implement the big changes that are necessary. Mm. But surely, don't, don't you see that there is this, that there's these new generations coming through that, that are sure on this stuff and that, that are environmentally conscious, that know this stuff is going on. We just need to wait until this generation moves into power. But what, are you saying we don't have time? No, we don't have time. And I remember when my daughter, who was 12 at Rio, and gave a speech that had a, quite an impact because she was a child and spoke not out of scientific expertise, but as a child, she spoke from her heart and mm. it went, had a huge impact. And I remember one of the reporters after came up and said, well, you know, you're right. We've done a terrible job of caring for the planet, but you kids, you're different. You're, you're going you're gonna to take us to a different way. And her response blew me away. She said, oh, is that your excuse, you grown-ups? Is that your excuse for not doing anything? Mm. You're going to wait till we do any, we change it? Mm. And then she said, why do you think we're going to be any different when you're our role models? We follow you. We mm. copy what you do. Mm. If you're not willing to show 
by what you do. That's like saying, you know, oh yeah, I know I smoke and it's not good for me, but you kids, don't you smoke? Yeah, yeah. How often does that work? Mm. Yeah. Mm. David, in my gloomier moments, um, I, I, I suspect that we're not going to get any kind of serious action on climate until until there's some, some, some real unavoidable, undeniable climate disaster. And then suddenly everybody's going to panic and it'll be you know, all hands to the pumps and a wartime response and so on. Um, clearly, it would be great if we could avoid it, but I really don't know how we can. Well, I, I'm afraid that uh, that pessimism is, uh, is warranted. I mean, when 15,000 people died one summer in Paris as a result of heat, I thought, that's it. That's got to be it. When all those people died in New Orleans as a result of Katrina, I thought, that's it. You know, there have been a number, when the Gulf spill happened, and day after day you saw this oil gushing out, I thought, that's it. You know, we're going to, 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 to begin the change now. Yeah. I don't know what the hell is wrong with us that we don't take these moments. So what's it going to take? Uh, maybe it's going to take millions and millions and millions of people to die before we're f we'll finally act. I don't know. But that is a, a denial of the very uh, attribute that was the, the secret of our success. The ability to avoid that kind of catastrophe by use, looking ahead. I think that we've got to just soldier on and do the best we can and hope that we can get to a tipping point when people finally say we we have to get on. And, and let me just say, I, I spent uh, five days in, in Australia and met mm. with a group called Beyond, uh, Beyond Zero Emission. And this is so exciting to me because here's a group that said, look, we've got to set a target and then we'll work to get our politicians and corporations onto that. It is now possible to say we can be off fossil fuels, to have zero emissions from fossil fuels within 10 years with technology that is already available. This isn't pie-in-the-sky stuff like carbon capture and, and sequestration or, mm. or uh, growing algae in ponds to take carbon out of the atmosphere. This is technology that already exists. We can, can do it. And according to this group, at less than the cost, the annual cost in Australia of the automobiles, new automobiles that are, are bought. So who, who are these people? Beyond Zero Emission. Huh. Okay. And it's, it's an umbrella group of a whole bunch of, of organizations. I think the challenge now is all of us have to come under the same tent and, and have a kind of target like this yeah. that we can all work towards in different ways. But that's ways. the problem about humanity, though. We're, we're, we're tribal. You know, we, we like to um, you know, segregate it geographically yeah. or into races or whatever. Yeah. And this is the one issue that we all need to, uh, as you say, come under that one umbrella. But um, it's just not in our nature. Well, you know, it's interesting. The one time you see it happening is in a science fiction movie. Yeah. When you have an invader <laughs> from outer space killing yeah, yeah. human beings. I've been watching Battlestar Galactica. That's exactly... Yeah. yeah. So then, the, you know, the Chinese government's <laughs> calling the Russians, calling the United States. <laughs> yeah. So it's great when the invaders from outer space... And, and <laughs> But they recognize we're just one species. doesn't yeah. matter what language you speak. The fact is, humanity is endangered. And we've got to understand that now the monster that's come here is us. Yeah. And we've got to yeah. unify in that way. But what I say is, for th we're not going to make it so long as environmentalists are taking, are carrying the agenda. Mm. We've got to broaden that tent. So I keep saying, look, hunger and poverty are my issues. Someone who's starving is not, and finds an edible plant or animal is not going to say, oh, I better consult that table. Are these endangered species? Mm. They're going to kill it and eat it. So hunger and poverty are my issues. People living under terror or genocide, they, they couldn't care less about the state of the planet. They're going to be worried about whether they can survive. So uh, genocide, terror, war, uh, uh, social justice, these are all our issues. And if we can all come under the same tent and work towards that sustainable future on, in different ways, but we know we're all aiming at the same target, that becomes a much bigger group. And that becomes, to me, a real movement. Mm. Okay. David Suzuki, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. And um, people can go and check out all your work and the Foundation's work on the website as well. And which... please go and have a look at Force of Nature because yes. uh, I want that film to be the stimulus for a lot of discussion. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. It's an inspiring message. Thank you. Good to talk to you. And thank you for having this, uh, uh, this uh, blog site I or, or YouTube or whatever you're doing. I think it's great to have this 
bash on. Good for you. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks, David. Bye-bye.